Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they're working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, today, we are honored to be sitting down with Kensington Prince Edward Island Mayor Rowan Casely. But before we get into today's interview, I'd like to ask a favor. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button or follow button. If you're watching this on YouTube, the subscribe button is right below. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts, please hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews And trust me, we have some amazing interviews lined up over the course of November, December, and even into January 2024. Your support, your subscriptions, helps us to continue to grow and bring you more quality content like you're about to hear today. So with that, on to our interview with Mayor Casely. Uh, Rowan, Rowan, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with a general question before we get into the crux of the interview. And it's an important question for me because it's the crux of what the entire interview will be about. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Rowan? Ah, interesting question. Um, Well, I've been, I've worked in the business world all my life, of course. And I was hitting retirement and I thought, I've got to do something. So what am I going to do? And municipal politics has always always been a cu- bit of a curiosity to me. And uh, I looked around town and I thought, I'm, ba- I'm back in my hometown. And I thought, well, I, I'd like to contribute. And I was wondering, there's things I thought that we might want to try and make improvements on in, in town. And, and I wanted to be part of it. So I decided, well, I'll, I heard that there was one uh, counselor that was not running. Uh, well, there's at least one opening, so maybe I'll, uh, I I wasn't dissatisfied with any of the ones that were running in council. So when there was an opening, I thought, well, maybe I'll run, and if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. So that's that's when I became I became I was a councillor for for five years before I uh, ran for mayor. And now I, I tried to do a little bit of research on you because I, I like to learn when you first got elected and when you became mayor. And the last election that I can find is 2014. Now, that's the first time you're elected mayor of Kensington, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So you were... Go ahead. It was by acclamation. Nobody else ran against me that time either. So So I want to go back to that very first election when you ran as a councillor. Because yeah. you you kind of seem like someone who has a pulse of their community. You uh, you're relatively well known in your community. You're a business owner, as you've just said. When you went out door knocking, do you remember what you were hearing? Were they municipal issues? Were they issues that people were talking about that were more macro issues about what the town is going to be going through, what the growth is going to be looking like? Or were they micro issues like I need a pothole fix? I need parks in my area. What were some of the issues in that first election that you remember? Because you said you you didn't seem to have an issue with the town. So what were you hearing from the people of the community? Right. Okay. First, just I want to clarify something. I I worked in business. I didn't have my own business. I worked for a uh, uh, farmer's dairy in uh, Halifax at the time. I apologize. I to so just just to clarify that. Um, actually, I when I went around door to door, I didn't hear too much uh, negative at all. I heard people say, "Okay, what are you what are you promising?" And I said, "I'm not promising anything. All I'm doing going to do." I said, "I'm only one vote on council, so I can't promise that I'm going to do something that I'm not going to be able to do." I said, "I'm just going to promise that I will do whatever I can there to try and make the best decisions for the town of Kensington." And that was basically it. As far as complaints, I think the uh, the only thing I recall hearing what at that point in time, back in and this was in 2009 was that there was a one or two homes said, we don't see the police department often enough, you know, uh, and that was that was the only thing. You, you've been uh, acclaimed a, a few times in your t- uh, tenure as a municipal uh, a politician, but I want to know how the role of municipal government has changed for you. I can imagine you are the the issues that you're dealing with when you first were elected to what you're dealing with now may be similar, but there may be some expansions on the issues, whether it be the cost of living, the affordability crisis. Have you seen municipal governments change in your tenure? And what has been the biggest 
uh, change for you personally to ensure that you're still offering the same service as a municipal politician to the residents of your community? Well, that's a big question. Um, I guess when I first first became councillor, the the town, we had a business park that was not full. We had the downtown core where we had several businesses that had, had closed and buildings that were, were not uh, in, in operation. And that was when we had some uh, warehouses in town that were not being used and land that was not being ad adequately used. And I, you know, that was one of the things that, that we started to work on as a, as a council. The, the biggest issues at that time were just try to create an environment for growth. And uh, we've we've done that, and now it's to the point now we're growing so fast that it's it's kind of hard to keep up. It's it's uh, it's I think it's it's the same everywhere in Canada. We're not we're not unique, but in the past uh, the, the last two censuses we were the, the census in two thousand and what was it sixteen I think we were the second fastest growing municipality in Prince Edward Island, and on the last one uh, in two thousand and twenty one I believe it was somewhere around the seventh or eighth. But you know, in in to put it in perspective, our population growth at that point in time in the 2021 census really didn't reflect our true growth because the census was reflected in January 2021, and the town had uh, uh, we expanded our boundaries that took place on May the first, 2021. So we 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 showed a population of 1,819 residents in in January, but we actually had in uh, in 2021, over 2,000, so we're around 2,100 residents now. So that's that's one of the things that's uh, that's been a bit of a change. And uh, our business park is now was was full. It was filled up in I think in 2014 or 15, somewhere around there. The business park was full. Some of the businesses were in the downtown core. Uh, they they've changed hands. There's new businesses there. So a couple of the buildings have been torn down, and a new bigger bigger uh, operation has been put in place. So the downtown core is really, really developing and the business park is full and to the point that we've had to uh, develop and build a new business park, which we just did. We opened it in October last year, I believe it was, yes, October last year. And uh, we've already sold, eight lots are sold and we got several several people interested. We got two, two buildings under construction right now. We've got more interest. And uh, I, I think you, what we can find is that our, our growth is, is really keeping up with the pace of the rest of Canada. And sometimes we, we feel we're getting a little bit going a little faster if we can keep up. I, I want to pick up on that because I'm assuming all the other mayors who are listening to this are saying growth is good, but growth comes with challenges as well. And for a community like yours, which is not a large community in the Grand Scans so across Canada, but for one of the larger communities in Prince Edward Island, growth is great. Do you see your role as mayor and as council in trying to steer that where people feel like they are still living in the same community that they moved to or they were raised in with the adaption of pe new people coming to the community and wanting to come because they see all the services that you might be providing. So they're happy that the growth is there. Yes. Well, we, we did a, a 10 year strategic plan. I think it's about four years ago now. And the, the motto, the basic uh, premise of that was where people choose to live. And some of the things that we that were very important in our uh, strategic plan was that we wanted to make sure that our community was continued to be a walkable community, where, pre, where residents and business owners felt safe, where everybody felt that this was a community they wanted to come and live in and stay in. And that's, that's, content, that's part of the reason why we think we are experiencing some of the growth that we are having. We are very fortunate on as one of our one of the municipalities. We're the the only other than the two cities. We're the only town that has their own municipal police force, and we've had that. And we've actually done a survey to see how the residents feel about it, and they they feel that if we can continue to maintain and keep our our municipal police force, then that is a benefit uh, long term. I help, I think it helps to make our community safe. And uh, and everybody feels that the the police are doing a great job, and they, they, the status quo is what they'd like to, uh, I guess, keep if as long as we can continue to afford it. 
Now, you've been on council for 13 years now, five years as a councillor and the remainder as a uh, mayor. Um, and I, I know you know this, and I, I want to sort of play in this playground for a little bit, but you've had to make some tough choices at that council table, whether it be budgets, whether it be increasing taxes, whether it be uh, zoning bylaws, this, that, or the other. You've had to make some very tough choices, which impact your residents the day after you make them. Now, you don't go off to Charlottetown to do your job. You don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You're in your community 24-7. So you go to your grocery store the day after you make those tough decisions. You're probably going to hear about them. When you go into that council meeting, every time you go into that council meeting, you have a weight on your shoulders that is pretty heavy because you're making decisions that will impact your residents. How much weight do you put on yourself to make sure you're prepared every time you go in, but have an understanding that, the decisions you're about to make may impact everyone, but it may impact everyone differently than how you hope people are going to be impacted. Well, I guess the way I, the way I prepare myself the best for that is that we're fortunate. We're very fortunate. I should say to have our, uh, our CAO, Jeff Baker working for the town of Candyton. <clears throat> and that has been a great benefit because he, he understands municipal politics, but he also understands municipal government and how a town needs to operate and continue to, uh, to continue to expand. So he and I spend a lot of, I spend a lot of time in the office being retired. I don't have anything else to do. So I spend a lot of time in the office here. So, so I, I'm aware of what's going on and Jeff and I, we, we meet regularly and whenever we're preparing stuff to bring to council, whenever we're preparing uh, decisions to be made, we have great discussions on what, what it means, what are the impacts, what are the pros and cons? And then we present all of that, the pros and cons to council. So they're as informed as we are. We try to anticipate every question that council may have that they may be faced with by the community and we address them. The, some of them are, some of them are good answers and some of them are, yeah, it's uh, this is, this is part of the cons, but, but here's the reasons why, you know, hopefully the pros are, are outweighing the cons. So I think that that's probably one of the things that helps me to be uh, a good leader in the community is by having good staff that, that do work for us. But but the decision ultimately lays on you. Well, administration yeah. is great. You have to make that final decision. Now, I, I, I can imagine, and I'm just imagining here for a second, that you, you also take a moment and ask people their general feelings about what things are happening in the community as well, whether it be residents at the grocery store, whether it be uh, at a local coffee shop, you name it, you're probably talking to the general public. Do you get an, a sense that people are engaged in the municipal realm when you want people to give their opinions on issues that are facing the community? I guess they're engaged when they don't agree with you. Uh, if they <laughs> agree with you, then then uh, you don't hear much. We, I, I must admit, I think we're very fortunate. I don't know if all municipalities are, are as fortunate as we are. I think our our residents do have a pretty good understanding of what we're doing. We try to keep we try to keep our lines of communication open, and and I do run into people at the grocery store and church or whatever, and there are issues come up. Uh, and they bring them to my attention. And if there's if there's something that we can do to fix those, we try to fix those and address them as quickly as possible. If it's something that that we can't, if it's something that's going to that is going to be the same way, I try to explain the rationale and the decision making behind the decision and what the what the pros and cons are and why why we made those decisions. And and generally speaking, I must say, I think we're we're fortunate that people pretty well accept. What, what we're doing as, as being the right decisions. I, I hear positive feedback all the time that, that what council is doing is, is moving in the right direction. I'm sure they don't agree. Everybody obviously is not going to agree with everything you say, but the majority of people I think are, are feeling positive about the direction we're going. How much respect, how much does respect come into play? Because while you're right, not 100% of the people are not going to agree on 100% of the issues. But you as mayor, as council, have to have a respect to your residents to say, you may disagree with me, and I have to respectfully listen to you and listen to you why you dis disagree with me, because you might change my mind. You may say something that I didn't think of. So how much does respect come into play? And I want to preface this by saying, 
respect goes both ways. So they have to respect you enough to not be yelling and shouting and screaming and saying negative things, but you have to respect them enough to give them the time to make, say their piece about why they think you've done the wrong thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're right. Re respect goes both ways. And I think that's as long as you respect the people that are talking to you, they are respect what you're saying as well. And I've never got into any real animosity type of, of arguments with anybody uh, to date. And I hope it continues that way. I, I think uh, as long as we're always willing to listen to one another and share the information, I think that that will solve most of the problems. You know, I know there's, I know there's times when, when somebody might have, well, I'll, give, I'll give an example. We had, we had uh, somebody want to make a presentation to council here, a committee of council here, just, uh, well, just last month. And they come in to see me and I knew what the issue was. And before the meeting started, I said, okay, I brought him into the office. We had a little chat. I told him some of the things that, because I was aware because he'd already talked to me before and I was aware of what the issue was and he wanted to bring it to council, see if there's anything we could do. So I brought him in and I, we talked about what the issue was and I don't want to get into what the issue was or who it was. And, but I said, but I will, I will give you five minutes to make your case to council. But in all honesty, there's probably limited things that we can do because there's, there's no bylaws being broken. Everything is being done according to all the regulations. You may not like what it is, but there's limit, we're limited in it. But I did, you know, tell them I, and since then, of course, I've gone and, and talked to somebody about the issue again to make sure that everything is, that they're aware and that there's, that it doesn't escalate into something further. And that meeting went respectful. He's been respectful. And I think, and even the other, the third party that was involved, they were respectful. I think just, just keeping, keeping everybody informed and, and trying not to, a whitewash that I think probably has a, has a big bearing on it. You, you bring up a good sort of question that I, I often ask, but I traditionally try not to, but it, it, it's not about issues. It's about jurisdictional yes. roles. It's yeah. about the knowledge that people may have and understanding that people may have of what the municipality is responsible for, what the province is responsible for, and what the federal government is responsible for. Yeah. Now, in my time, in the last few years, I've seen more and more residents not understanding the jurisdictional roles. And I hate to paint a broad stroke here, but in your community, do you find people understanding that you have a role as mayor, your MLA has a role as a MLA, and the MP has a role in their jurisdictional role as the federal government's representative, and people are only asking you about municipal issues, or are they asking you about federal and provincial issues as well? Generally speaking, uh... I don't know if we're, if we're, maybe we're just fortunate. We don't, <laughs> most, I think most people do have a pretty good understanding. PEI is probably a little more unique because everybody knows everybody here. And uh, even the, you know, like for me to sit down and talk to one of the local MLAs or the, or anybody in any of the cabinet ministers, it's easy to, to uh, get in touch with them. And if, if somebody does come to me and it's a municipal or it's a municipal issue, of course, then yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that. We'll deal with it right away. If it's a provincial issue, I will give them the contact name. Sometimes I will even say, look, I will reach out to the, uh, to the government, to the provincial government and see what, what can be done. And I can even, I can even talk to our local MP for this area as well. I know him. Uh, I know them all personally. So that, that helps. Uh, but I think, I think generally speaking, and, and maybe I'm rose-colored glasses here, but I gen think generally speaking, people have a pretty good understanding in our municipality, either that or they just were fortunate. Hey, I, I, maybe, they I, just, I, maybe they just maybe they just think we we've got it all in hand and we're gonna we'll we'll hand it off to the to the province and and things get looked after. It's it doesn't always go 100, percent but generally speaking, I I. I wouldn't really say there was anything that I could be real that comes to mind that I could be really critical of where, where an issue has happened that I could reflect on that that was not that way. Now, we've only been chatting for 20 minutes now, and I, I get a sense that you are a very community-oriented man. Uh, you, yeah. you seem to want the best for your community, and you seem to strive to better your community. But you know that the job is part-time, but it's full-time. 
And this is yeah. the big thing that I, I want to ask, because I can imagine there's days that, you know, when you go outside your house, you have to be mayor uh, Casely when you go to the grocery store, to the church. And there's days that you just want to be wrong. You just want to just relax yeah. and not have to sort of deal with the day to day issues that are going on. But you have to because if someone stops, you have to give them their time in your time yeah. in office. Have you found that balance? Have you found the balance of being a, an elected official in a community and just being yourself and just being able to relax? Or are you constantly understanding that, you know what, I signed up for the job and I'm going to do it full time, even if it is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year? Yeah. Uh, I think I found the balance. I, I think it helps that I know a lot of people in the community, which helps. And the the places where I go, I'm running into friends. I'm running into, you know, people that I'm aware of. And, and they're, everybody is, I think we're all trying to get along. I, I don't, when I go into the grocery store or I go into church or I go into any, any of the meetings, I don't win with any kind of apprehension. I win, I'm, I'm excited to be there. I'm, I'm glad to be there. And I, I never know, I'm usually, I'm, I'm going in as Rowan. Uh, sometimes I'm I'm mayor when I get there, but I'm I'm going in as Rowan, and and it's kind of hard. I don't look at them as being two different roles. I, I uh, th this may sound strange, but I I'm just sitting here in the chair, and I may have the title of mayor, but to me I'm Rowan to everybody out there. So when they're asking me a question, they're asking me a question as Rowan, and I'm going to go and and uh, if I, if I have to put on my mayor hat to get something to try to get something, I will do it. But in a lot of cases, it's uh, sometimes people are just asking me, "Look, where do where who do I talk to to get something like this done? Or do you know how I could how I could get something done about this? Or where should I go?" So sometimes it's it's them asking, uh, "How do who do I talk to? Or or can you do something about it?" So I, I guess I'm, I'm maybe I'm lucky that way. You, you, it seems like you have got it made here, uh, your mayor, because it seems like, and I'm not, not, not trying to uh, throw shade on you here, but it seems like you have a community that's understanding. You have a community that wants the yeah. best. You seem to want the yeah. best and you have a, you seem to uh, just do the job and do it so well. Mm -hmm. So I, the next question that I'm about to ask is kind of going to be a weird question because I don't know what you're going to answer because usually I have an understanding of what you're going to answer by this time, but I don't know. And before I ask this question, though, I'm going to preface it by saying this. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is just the mayor's opinion. So again, I don't know what you're going to say, and it's going to be interesting to see where what rabbit hole we go down here, Rowan. But in your opinion, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing your community today as of recording this episode? Really, the biggest issues are, and I'm sure this is probably no different than anybody else, it's it's money, it's funding. Our, our CAO, Mr. Baker, and I, we often joke, if somebody gave us $20 million today, we'd have it spent in a week. And we'd be looking for another $20 million. And I don't think that's any different than any other community. The, the demands of any municipality, I think, are trying to keep up with the growth that we're doing. Growth, growth requires expansion of, of the services. It requires the expansion of uh, infrastructure, whether it's water and sewer, whether it's housing or whatever. And there's some of those things are well, like housing is, is we don't look at housing as being a, a, a municipal responsibility. Our responsibility for housing is to work with the developers. We don't build how we don't build housing ourselves. We don't have the funding to do it. We don't have the resource to do it, but our, uh, for us, we would work with developers. We try to uh, assist them whenever we can. We, we try to provide the, the zoning and the bylaws to try and uh, uh, provide the, uh, the, the the density and the alternative of housing services. And we're just going through uh, revising our our zoning and uh, bylaws and official plan right now. We're matter of fact, we've got a meeting this month with our public meeting for what we're what we're proposing. And that's part of what part of what what our challenges are to help developers meet the demand for housing. The other one is is funding. We're we're like any municipality, I'm sure. We can always use more funding, and uh, we we currently we're currently in negotiations with the province on trying to get more of the 
provincial property tax portion comes to us, when all the property taxes that are collected in Kensington, they approximately 50%, I mean, the, some of the government collects, collects it all and then they re or send, send our portion, our, our municipal portion to us. And then we do get some other tax credits for other things uh, from the provincial government that, that comes out of property tax revenue. But really when it comes right down to it, 50% of all the property tax that's collected in Kensington approximately, I'm, I'm, I'm using figures here right now, probably goes to the province and only 50% of that ever comes back to, to the municipality. So we're limited on that, on that respect. So we have to find funding sources whenever we're trying to do infrastructure whether we're trying to improve water or trying to improve service or sewer, whether we're trying to put new sidewalks in and, and expand uh, areas, we have to live, live within our limited property tax base that we have and our and funding sources. Our property tax has was 55 cents per hundred dollars of assessment when I came into office 14 years ago. It's still 55 cents per hundred dollar of assessment. Our growth in municipal funding has to come from expanded growth in the community, expanding the business side of things, expanding the residential side. And we work with developers to get those, get those buildings done. So um, let's go down this rabbit hole because I think this is an important conversation. I think people need yeah. to understand. Um, you're right. Uh, funding money is a big thing for a lot of municipalities right now, but you know, and I'm assuming you know that the provincial government and the federal government don't take their uh, uh, they don't put their foot on the gas when it comes to giving more money out to municipalities. So this means that municipalities are left holding the bag. And I kind of have to ask this question. And I apologize if it comes off insincere, but you still need to grow. And you need to grow in a way that is affordable for the people. And you just said something that was very shocking to me that you're at 55 cents per every hundred. And that's still after 14 years as you in office. How do you see yourself growing? How does the community grow without doing it on the backs of the residents and not do it on the backs of service levels as well? It, it is a challenge, and uh, that becomes some of the decisions that we have to make in council. That's where you have to make some hard decisions sometimes that you can't, you just can't go and do everything because you have to, you have to pay the bills. So there are hard decisions to be made at times, and uh, we've been in, we've been experiencing great growth in, in infrastructure improvements and over the last uh, several years. And we're hitting a point now where we have to be careful that we don't go a little bit too far because we do have to service the debt. The one thing that we're counting on is the growth in our business park. And as I mentioned earlier, we've already sold eight lots in there. And I, we got, well, I've got in, in discussions that could be as many as another 10 to 10 or 11 lots of, of expressions of interest. So if we can do that and get the growth and get the in, increased uh, property tax from those uh, operations, that's where we're going to be able to continue to expand the, the community. And when we when we expanded the community back in 2021, well, I guess it was 21, yes, uh, expanded our boundaries. Basically, all we did is we squared up the boundaries. We had, we had leapfrog growth, we'll call it, in places. There'd be places where you'd be, you'd go to road, and one side of the road was, was in town, the other side of the road was outside of town. So you can see when you start to square up your boundaries, you kind of take in weird places where you'd, you'd one house would be in town and the next house would still be out of town. So we, we just basically squared things up. We didn't we didn't go and take a wholesale uh, space or anything like that. When we did that, the, the province did approve it uh, and it took place. But but what. We took on all the responsibilities for fire, for policing and uh, planning and everything else for the, those expanded areas. But the there is a, a tax holiday. We don't get any property tax revenue from anybody in those prop, those new ones that come into town for five years. And then it grows 20% a year for the next five years. So it's 10 years that we're providing free service. to Well, 10 years that we're providing service to those areas but it's 10 years before we start to get the full benefit of, of that revenue. That was a decision that we were prepared to, well, we were, we're recommending we go three to four years, not 10, but anyway, it, it is what it is. 
you make the best of what you've got. And uh, I'm sure the province had very good, valid, justifiable reasons why they wanted to go that direction. It's contrary to us, but still, it's in the long term. We have to we have to take a look at things and say we're in this for the long term. It's not tomorrow. It's not next year. It's the next year. It's long term as well. And in the long run, it's going to be beneficial to the town. And uh, we will. We just have to wait till we have that revenue before we can do other things. Are developers knocking on your door right now? Are developers for not even just businesses, but for housing units knocking on your door saying we want a building in your community? Uh, yes, uh, we have developers right now that uh, I've had meetings in the last, uh, just in the last week of somebody who wants to come actually come in and uh, build in an area. And uh, it's a, it's actually, we don't own the land. It's actually owned by the province. And uh, we've actually had meetings with the, uh, with the province to see if we can uh, get that subdivided off because it just hasn't been, it just needs to be subdivided off and then they can sell the lots and, and it could be developed. And we have other developers that are looking to, to expand their subdivisions if they can just get moving forward. You, you've been talking about how uh, your community has been going through a massive amount of growth over the last few years, particularly since 2016 to, to, to 2023 when we're recording this. Um, you know that growth only happens when you do have those infrastructure projects in place. Are you coming up to a point of slow growth here because the infrastructure upgrades aren't keeping pace with what the growth is happening in your community? I don't think so. I think we, I think we've done well. Time will tell. <laughs> I think we've been able to balance that growth uh, and uh, where we've been growing. I think we've been able to balance it fairly well. And I think if whether when when we get these subdivisions and if they expand, I think we're we're in a good position to do that. We we do have a a meeting. Uh, matter of fact, just next week, I believe it is. Yes, to with our with our engineers to actually take a look at at our overall plan of what what the town is going to look like because we want to, that's one of the things we want to take a look at is our our water and sewer long term plans and where where should we be focusing our attention so we're we're we're, we're okay right now and we're next week we're actually looking at a, a, a long term master plan to see if we need to be making some changes so out of that we may find some uh, some uh, challenges uh, but we hopefully will end up finding some uh, something that help us plan for the long term. So uh, I, I'm hope I'm hopeful that we do, that we're getting the jump on the gun here. But we, time will tell. Now you you've mentioned a few things that you believe are the biggest issues and issues that are facing your community. But if I was to go talk to a hundred people in your community and I asked them that exact same question they would probably yeah. give me a hundred different answers. And you know that for sure, that yeah. everyone has their own issues. Yeah. You as council have to weed through the issues that people have in their community, plus with the issues that you see as a community as a whole. How do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual to make sure that the individual feels like their issues are being addressed if it doesn't align with that strategic plan or the priority set out in a budget for the community? Well, I guess I guess the way we would do it is we well the way I've done it uh, when I'm if somebody's coming to me with a particular issue if there's nothing we can do about it and I, I'm I'm hoping I understand the question correctly I would try to explain why that maybe may not be something we can do now yeah. and why we're why we have to make some different choices it's 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 not easy sometimes it, to say is it hard to say I'll no to people uh, it it is. It is. It's always hard to say no, uh, <laughs> but if you can, if you have good reasons and you can justify. But I, I have people say, why don't you get, why don't you put a sidewalk? We need a sidewalk there. Uh, yes, we probably do need a sidewalk there, but we also need a sidewalk here and here and here and here and here, and we can't do them all. We we can't. You, you don't want us. To, you don't want us to raise the taxes, put the sidewalk in, do you? Oh no, no. Well, then you have to have to. Uh, Keep in mind that we're trying to balance budgets and and needs and trying to hit the most critical needs. Though obviously we're going to pick needs that we think are the are the greatest, which may not everybody may not agree with our decision, but you know, we're we're cha we're charged with our responsibility and hopefully we get it right 95% of the time. 
Uh, I'd like to think we do. I'd like to think we do if we get it right 100% of the time. But I'm sure there are listeners that would say, uh, you know, you're a little bit high and a little bit uh, you know, optimistic. You're probably maybe only getting a 75%. But but that depends on who's doing the judging, I guess. Um, I, now, I've been accused on this show of being talking too much negativity when it comes to communities. So I'm going to flip the switch a little bit here, and I'm going to ask you, what do you boast about when it comes to Kensington? What do you talk to other mayors and councillors and people from across Canada and say, you know what, you may be doing it good, but we're doing it better. We're, we've got it great out here. What is the thing and the issues that you point to and say, you know what, other communities are going through rough times, but we've got it good here because we've got this. What are those issues for you? Well, I think the thing that helps us the most, to be quite honest with you, is we're very open and transparent. One of the things that we do is every, every council meeting, whether it's a committee of council or it's a council meeting, everything that is coming before council is posted on the website. We also send it out to the local paper, to the, to the provincial paper, and to CBC and CTV. They all get this so they can look at what is coming up before council. And not only the, it's, it's not just the agenda. If there's if the package that goes to council is 200 pages, then that's what they get. They get 200 pages so they can see everything that we're doing. We're very open. We're very transparent. If any residents want to know why are you doing this? All they got to do is read the request for a decision. The request for a decision says this is what we're going to do. This is why we want to do it. Here's the pros in doing it. Here's the cons in doing it. Here's the cost of doing it. And here's the resolution. They know what's coming before council. Council are, are well versed and well prepared when they come into a council meeting. The public, if they want to come into a meeting, they are welcome at any public, any meeting. We do live stream our council meetings. So we, we record them and live stream them. So anybody wants to watch them on Facebook, they can. Uh, and the and the information is all there. So I think that that is probably the thing that has probably helped to keep the community and everybody informed on what we do and why we do. And to me, that I think is probably the well, it's one of the one of the best things that uh, that I think we can do as a as a municipal municipal government. We always say we are the closest. The municipal governments are the closest to the people. Well, we feel this is what keeps us close to the people. We, 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 wanna, we wanna keep them informed. And uh, if they have some information to, we have our committee meetings on the fourth Monday of the month. Committee of council is all of council is there. All of council is there to receive all the information to make all these decisions or make all the recommendations. They would recommend it to council. And we, uh, in most cases, the recommendations of committee are approved by council, but there are, times there's there's always a two week period in between our committee meeting and our council meeting and that allows councillors to go out and get if they have any feedback from the community that's when they'll get it and if they if the residents in the community have any interest in it that's when they'll they'll get a hold of somebody and say oh by the way you know you were talking about doing this did you know this then when it comes to council that extra piece of information will come forward and has everything that council has recommended always been gone through 100%? No, there have been changes from feedback in between that a, a, a committee recommended that we go do something. But when it came to council, the, the resolution actually got changed because of additional feedback. So I think I think that's what's important. It's it's transparency and openness. We don't we don't try to hide anything, and uh, as a result of that. Everybody's aware of what we're trying to do. And that, that I think, helps us to be perceived as being doing nothing but the right thing for Kensington. Thank you for that. Um, I want to turn to my last subject because I'm very cautious of time here and we're almost at the 40 minute mark. And I want to talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and that is tourism. I think municipalities play a role in tourism across this country, and I think more Canadians should be visiting our great communities and spending our economic dollars here in Canada instead of sunny Cancun. Don't get me wrong. I love Cancun. Maybe if they want to sponsor me, they can. But right now, I'm going to the communities in Canada. So as a tourist who is going to be coming through PEI next summer, hopefully, knock on wood if everything goes to plan, um, what should I come and see in Kensington? Okay, well, first thing you do is come come and see me when you're in the town. <laughs> Will I, do. <laughs> I, I personally invite, I, I'll invite you to drop in and see me. 
call and make sure I'm here. Uh, the in when I became mayor, one of the first things I did was I met with a bunch of the people in within the tourism industry to see if we could get some sort of a committee going to start to try to get not only the not only what we offer in Kensington. Kensington is a is a service center for about twelve thousand people. We probably only have two thousand, a little over two thousand residents here. But the population or the population in the area and the wider area of Kensington is where a lot of the tourists come. In Kensington, we actually have, if you want to see something in Kensington, the, the Haunted Mansion is a, is a place that you want to go. That's a tourist operation. We, we do have on every Wednesday night, we have uh, during July and August, we have what we call summer music nights. And that's few, free music. We have entertainment every Wednesday night uh, for tourist area to come and be entertained. Uh, there's sometimes there, there might be uh, some uh, uh, ice cream people sell, selling stuff there too. But our purpose of that was, and, it, and this all came partly from, uh, from discussions with the, with the tourism association, but the purpose of that music nights in the summer is to try to encourage tourists to stay one more night. We have it in the evening from six to eight o'clock. So then if they want to say it stay one more night. So it helps not only Kensington, but it also helps the surrounding community. The uh, the committee eventually that formed out of the gathering of all the tourist operators that we talked about became known as Heart of PEI uh, Committee. And it's a subcommittee under the Chamber of Commerce because we work closely with the Chamber of Commerce. So the town is a partner in that Heart of PEI. And we're cont we've continued to... Uh, We've actually given them money to to do some of the projects that they want to do, and it's not the projects are not always in Kensington. Some of them are outside the community as well, which is part of it. But I, I think if you're coming to PEI, you're going to come to restaurants. We have the best restaurants in Canada, we'd say, but uh, I'm sure that there's others equally as good. So we have the top notch restaurants in Canada. Canada. The uh, outside and the outside areas, there's a lot of uh, tourist cottages and, and, and facilities like that. You want to go kiteboarding, you can go kiteboarding. You want to go, there's a water park and cabin that's only 20 minutes away. We're fortunate that we're close to a lot of tourist operations, tourist establishments that you can come to Kensington and, and base out of here, but uh, go elsewhere to, to entertain your children or adults. It's oh, I should mention, we also, we also have... The uh, Under the Spire uh, Music Festival, which is just five kilometers out of town, which is in the old historic St. Mary's Church. And those concerts take place every, from July and August, and I think even into September. So there's there's concerts and music concerts. It's high class. It's it's world renowned. And, and there's great entertainers there. So those are, those are some of the things that, that you want to see. It sounds like, it truly sounds like, and I'm not trying to boast you here a little bit, but I'm going to. It sounds like you have something for a true family getaway. It sounds like you have yeah. something that if a family's going looking for something to do, or even someone just by themselves or a couple, there's something to do. And it's a very uh, community oriented community in some sense. Yeah, it, it is. There's, there's always something to do, whether it's depending on what your age is, you know, if you just if you're seniors and you just want to go and have a, a good meal, then you'll get you'll get great meals. If you got want to be entertained, want to scare the kids, take them to the haunted mansion. And if it happens to be during Halloween time, uh, the they do have an escape route that uh, some kids can't get through all the way through the haunted mansion uh, without without taking the escape route. I know that from experience. My grandchildren have not made it through. I wouldn't <laughs> take them in during Halloween. I'm not sure if I want to go during Halloween, but but I hear it's quite scary and and it's uh it's it's quite quite well known here in this area. So I want to leave on this and I want to ask the million dollar question here now, Rowan. And I think it's a question that every municipal politician knows how to answer. I just like to hear it from them. In your opinion, what makes the town of Kensington such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Very simply, the people. The people in the town are friendly, open, and welcoming. And I believe the business community is the same, friendly, open, and welcoming. Uh, we're the, the community is becoming more diverse every year, uh, which which is which is great. 
but I, I don't know. I, I mean, that may sound like a cliche, but but really, it's when you're when you're in Kensington, it's not unusual to have people. You, if you're walking down the street, they'll say hello. You know, it's it's not. You don't walk by people. You know, you you, you speak to people. We're we're friendly, and and everybody's open. Rowan, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor to sit down with you uh, for the last 45 minutes and talk about your community, talk about yourself. And I, I, I know I said it earlier on, but I want to say it again. Thank you for serving your community. It seems like you truly do have a passion for your community and it comes across in this interview. So I appreciate it. And I thank you so much. And yes, I will look you up and hopefully we can go grab a coffee uh, while we're out and maybe, maybe go do, do a tour of that haunted mansion while I'm in the community. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll get you in. I'll go again. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support either. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering you the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of this community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues what truly matter to you and to our communities. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.